From the beginning of my student years, I tried to think outside the box, as they say. You mean uh, not exactly. And I think the reason was, if there is a reason to talk about, is actually because when you listen to lectures at the university, it's very shablonic, it's very structured, stratified, and so on. And, uh, and then when you hear about discoveries that were made over the years, you see that these people who discovered something new didn't go through the structure and through the organize. They always had some other ideas that were outside the box. So I tried to imitate them in a way that um, I always was thinking if I go into research, I'll try to find an original angle. Then I went to uh, as a postdoc at the University of California in Berkeley, and I was fortunate to work with a pioneer in enzymology, Daniel Koshland, who later became also editor-in-chief of Science magazine. And, and with him, actually, we generated some very novel concepts about how enzymes are regulated. And that proved to me that uh, if you think a little bit outside the box, you can achieve uh, success, scientific success, because it's new. So from that point on, when I went to study informational transfer in cells and between cells, we also generated some novel ideas. Uh, one of them is actually the reason why I got this Wachter Prize. And uh, so I think it was an evolution. It was never a point where I can show it started. I think I always started to, when I go into a field, to do something that uh, is innovative. When I first uh, did my work on these inhibitors that I'm going to discuss in the meeting, and actually that's the... And I submitted a grant proposal. It was rejected out of hand by very famous people whom I know and then became colleagues of them because they said it was impossible. And uh, then, of course, that's the first step in the development of a new idea. They first tell you it's impossible. Then they tell you it's possible but not very important. And the third phase is we knew it all along, right? And the last one, we invented it. <laughs> so that's usually the evolution of such, uh, not always, but that happens quite a few times. And in fact, it did happen to me, uh, and, uh, but I'm not uh, alone in this game. And you have problems in publishing. You have to be lucky to have your original idea published very quickly, and that usually happens if you are highly wired politically. Mm -hmm. And that happens to people too, so I think it's important to be wired, but it, I realized it late in my life. But you get support, you know from whom? From your students, because they are your most critical. They tell you right out, you are wrong, you are wrong. You, you, this is a stupid idea, they'll tell you that. If it's a very good idea, and some of your students really support it, then you get confidence that you're on the right path. And that has been my luck, that all my students and my colleagues who worked with me were very supportive, not because I, had, I was authoritarian or I was commanding them, no, no because we shared similar um, ideas about the concepts that we developed, and the ideas are usually a common development with my students. Today in science, it's not one man alone. It's not an Einstein type of thing. In biology and chemistry, it's, uh, these concepts evolve out of experiments, out of thinking, and it's many times it's a collective experience yeah. with your students. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why it is always a benefit and a pleasure to be surrounded by young people as I am now. I am getting older, but my students remain always the same age, you know, between 25 and 35. And that's a benefit that very few people have. But that's what we have in academia. If we are active in science and we produce 
uh, research, then we always work with young people. Young people have always good ideas, many times better than yours, and you are lucky to work with them. And that's what I feel. As I told you, uh, everything we do is a team project. Uh, part of my team is right here. And uh, this is Maya, who is a postdoctoral fellow, and this is Yael, who is a graduate student, advanced PhD student, and so is Nufar. And Efrat also is uh, finishing her PhD very soon. And, uh, then, and they, you know, they are doing interesting research in the different fields of uh, signal transduction, signal transduction therapy, as we call it. In fact, I was educated at the Weizmann Institute uh, for my PhD, and the atmosphere is very straight. That means uh, I talk to the professor like he's a colleague and friend. It was exactly the same in the University of California in Berkeley, where I worked with Koshland, who was a great scientist and a fantastic person with great sense of humor. We you know it was no difficulty to to tell him what you think, and you didn't have the and the fear as if you are alienating him. No, he always went welcomed criticism. And I think this open communication is extremely important for the advancement of whatever intellectual venture you are going through. In the last 25 years, I have focused more on medical applications of the knowledge that I have gathered before. So now I'm very interested and still very active in trying to develop new therapies for cancer, which is a very complex and difficult disease. And uh, I don't know if it, you call it heritage, but I think this is my culture at the moment. Looking at the list of people who got the prize so far, puts me in a very distinguished list. So that's why I'm very gratified and thankful that I was chosen, you know. And therefore I think it's, a, you know, it's an important prize for me anyway, because I see the, the kind of people who now I belong to. Whether I deserve it or not, this is for others to decide.